الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلاة ربي وسلامه عليه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everybody to tonight's session of Friday Night Lights and we're going to be talking about the Salah Now Dr. Ahmed Bassam Sa'i has a wonderful book called Idarat al-Salah which in English is called Communicating with God and he tells the story of a time when he was invited by university students in MSA. And he went to this event and it was packed. People came from all over to listen to him. And when he got up and he stood in front of this crowd, he pulled a sheet of paper and he read Alhamdulillah, Salat Salam Rasulillah, and he made no eye contact with anybody and he read some verses of the Qur'an and some hadith and he rushed through them and then he looked up at everybody finally and he said to everybody, I'm sorry, I have somewhere else that's more important to be and then he walked off stage. And you can imagine the confusion on the faces of people. You can imagine how offended some people were. Like they came from all over to listen to him. And he tells them, I have somewhere more important to be, and walks off stage. And then, as the people started to speak amongst themselves, he turned around and he walked back to the podium. And he said to them, that was offensive, right? But how many times do we do that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the salah? We rush through the prayer. We're not paying attention to what we're saying. We're not making any connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's as if we are saying, I would really love to have this conversation. I would really love to be present if I didn't have somewhere else to be right now. And so this topic is a beautiful topic. And it is an important topic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qada aflaha al mu'minun. Allah says, successful are the believers. And after Iman, the first quality he mentions after Iman is Those who have this beautiful word that is so hard to translate khushu' Humility, presence, focus, mindfulness, stillness And it means all of these things But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says those who have khushu' in their prayers And so how do we have khushu' in this prayer of ours? What can we do? The first thing that I want you to know is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those who have khushu' in their prayers. And Allah didn't say those who have khushu' in the prayer. Your prayer is particular to you. Your prayer as a mom of five is different than your prayer when you were a university student. Your prayer as a university student is going to be difficult, different than your prayer when you are working in a cubicle somewhere or praying in a stairway before you get back to work. Your prayers are going to be different throughout your own life. And that's okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ Those who have khushu' in their prayers. You are only comparing yourself to you. When you read the stories of the people of Khushur, sometimes it is incredibly inspiring, and sometimes it makes you seem like you are either you or they were from a different world all completely. Urwa ibn Zubair radiallahu is a famous example of that. Urwa ibn Zubair is the son of a Zubair ibn al Awam, he's the son of Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, he's the younger brother of Abdullah ibn Zubair. It is a family that is famous for their worship. His father is a companion, one of the greatest companions. His grandfather is a companion. His parents are companions of the greatest companions. And so Urwa, who grew up in the house of his aunt Aisha, and Urwa radiallahu anhu, he says that Aisha passed away, before Aisha passed away by five hijaj, by five years, by five hajj. She, before she passed away, I had absorbed everything she had of knowledge. I completely took advantage of the presence of my aunt. I learned everything that Aisha knew. And he became one of the fuqaha of Medina. When Urwa is journeying to Damascus on a trip to Asham, he has a disease in his leg. 
that requires when he gets to the Khalifa, the Khalifa sends his doctors and the doctors command Urwa, they say your leg, this leg of yours has to be amputated. And when Urwa radiallahu anhu is being offered his options, how are we going to numb this, this amputation that's going to happen? And they offer him wine and he says no. He says, wait until I get into the salah. Let me pray. And when I get into the salah, when you see that I've gotten into the zone, then do what you wish. And it's a story that if it wasn't authentically reported, it would be hard to believe. But he was amputated, his leg. And then on his journey still, he gets news that his son dies. And when he gets back to Medina, and people come and they visit him, all he says, لَقَدْ لَقِيْنَا مِنْ صِفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَبًا we've, we've been exhausted and fatigued by this journey of ours. So when you read these types of stories, you're like, this is khushu'. This is what khushu' is. You have to be in a place where your leg can be amputated and you don't feel it. Well, I feel everything when I'm in salah. I want to start with this because I want you to know that the best guidance is the guidance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even when you hear these stories of even great companions, Abdullah ibn Zubair, his older brother, a boulder would be flying from the catapult of Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf while he was besieged in Mecca. And Abdullah ibn Zubair would not move. Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who was the imam of the Khashi'in, and he was the best of them, and the best of us, he would shorten the prayer because he would hear the crying of a baby. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would feel the presence of his grandchildren on his back. And so he would lengthen the prayer or his sujood because of that. So khushur does not necessarily mean that the world completely dissolves all around you and you don't feel or see or hear anything. That's not the case. But sometimes when you read that in books, you feel that that is the case. Khushur is particular to you. It is to be present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to share with you right from the get-go. I want to share a number of tips on how, inshallah ta'ala, this next prayer that we pray, Salat al-Isha, is going to be better. And these are tips that you can take for every day of your life, inshallah ta'ala. The first is to make a truce with time. The first is to make a truce with time. That you say to yourself, Allah is the controller of time. Because shaitan wants you to rush through the salah. He wants to distract you from the salah. Shaitan realizes when he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لَقْعُدَنَّ لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I am going to sit for them on your straight path and I'm going to ambush them. I'm going to come from the right of them and from the left of them, in front of them and from behind of them. Shaitan, when he knows that you are not going to travel down a sirat al-mustaqim with a vehicle after tawheed that is more, that is better than salah. There's nothing that's better than salah. And so shaitan is going to ambush you in the salah. And that's why we get so distracted in the salah in a way that we don't get distracted outside of the prayer. It said that Imam Abu Hanifa, the man, a man came to him and he said, Imam, I've, I've, I've buried some of my wealth and I forgot where I buried it. And so Imam Abu Hanifa, he said to him, you know, this isn't really a fiqh question, but perhaps just go and pray to Ra'as to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make dua that you're able to find it. That's what I can tell you to do. So the man, Allahu Akbar, enters into his salah, reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. All of a sudden, he remembers where he buried the money. He got so excited, he didn't even finish the salah. He walked off. He came to Imam Abu Hanifa and he said to him later, he said, Jazakallah khair, it worked perfectly. I was in the salah and all of a sudden I remembered where it was. Imam Abu Hanifa said to him, I did not think that shaitan would allow you to pray two rak'ahs uninterrupted. I didn't think that shaitan would let you pray two rak'ahs. Just two. I didn't think he would let you do it. He would remind you. And this is something that we've all experienced. I had one brother, I was mentioning this, and he said to me, subhanAllah, he said, My, we were traveling one time with our family, and on the day of travel, my mom realizes she doesn't know where her passport is. Could you imagine the stress? The entire family is looking for this passport. Everybody is searching. And he said, so Salat al-Dhuhr came. I was like, you know what, we've been searching for the past couple of hours, I might as well just 
pray the Lord and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to find the passport. He said, Allahu Akbar, started reciting, remembered where the passport was. And then he spent the next four rak'ahs thinking about where the passport is. Shaitan does that because the Prophet ﷺ was asked about al-iltifatu fi salah and he said, huwa ikhtilas, ikhtilisu shaytanu min salat al-abd. He said that it is a theft. That distraction in the prayer is a theft that shaitan steals from your prayer. And so the first thing is that you make a truce with time. When shaitan comes to you and says, you don't have time, you got to get back to this book report, you need to get back to this essay, you need to get back to this exam, studying for this exam, you need to beat traffic, you need to leave work, it's going to be rush hour, all of this type of stuff, that you tell yourself, Allah is the controller of time. Don't tell me, shaitan, that I don't have time when Allah is the controller of time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who puts barakah in my time. And so if I've only got an hour to study, let me not rob from Salat al-Dhuhr for that hour because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make the next 50 minutes of my studying more beneficial than the last three hours. Or I could rush through the prayer so that I can get those 50 minutes and then those 50 minutes could be absolutely useless for me on the exam. I could rush through the prayer so that I can jump in my car and, and try to beat traffic and sit in the longest traffic jam ever. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could put barakah in my time. Allah could put barakah in my time so that traffic is smooth. But I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the presence right now of the one who controls everything. To give you just one example of how tricky shaitan is. When you are standing, that is when you start thinking of everything in the world. You start thinking about your sick uncle. You start thinking about that kid that you punched in eighth grade. You start thinking of all of these random things when you're standing, right? Now, when you go into sujood, what do you think about? When you go into sujood, what do you think about? When you're standing, all of these problems come in your head. But when you go into sujood, what do you think about? For many of us, we don't think about anything. Subhan Rabbi al-A'la, Subhan Rabbi al-A'la, Subhan Rabbi al-A'la, bounce back up. But... If you had thought about all of those people in sujood, what could you have done? I could have made dua for them. I could have made dua for my sick uncle. I could have made dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives me for that kid that I punched in eighth grade and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them success wherever they are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of those problems that came in my mind while I'm standing, if I had remembered them in sujood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I could have asked Allah to fix them, to bless them, to preserve them, to protect them, whatever it is. But shaitan makes us remember things in standing when it's not beneficial for us and then we forget them while we're in sujood. This is a trick that we keep losing at every single day. And so remembering your problems in your sujood is helpful for you. But remembering them during qiyam when you're supposed to be reciting and conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not. And so number one is a truce with time. Number two is seek stillness in every station. There's a famous hadith which is called the hadith of the man who prayed badly. The hadith of the man who prayed badly. This man, he prays a salah, and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa after the salah, he comes and he gives salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says to him, Arji' fasalli fa inna kalam tusalli. Arji' fasalli fa inna kalam tusalli. Go back and pray because you didn't pray. So now the man knows he's being watched by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So then he goes and he prays again. And then he goes and he gives salam to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says back to him, Irji' fa salli fa tusalli. Go back and pray because you didn't pray. A third time he goes and he prays. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, Go back and pray because you didn't pray. The man says, Oh Messenger of Allah, I don't know any prayer other than this. This is the only way I know how to pray. And so then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then told him a number of things. He told him that when you get up to pray that you face the qibla and that you make takbiratul ihram while you're standing and then you read what is easy of, for you of the Qur'an and then he says hatta he says and then bow until you are tranquil in your bowing and then stand until hatta qa'ima until you are completely erect when you're standing and then go into sujood hatta sajida and then you, you are tranquil in your sujood in your prostration the idea here, what's being repeated is tranquility, tranquility, stillness, stillness. Some people, when they go into ruku', there's no moment of time where they're actually still. They're bouncing. And then when they, when they get up from ruku', they don't even hit a 90 degree ankle. They're at 80 degrees and already they're on the way down. 
and then they peck at the ground on their sujood. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that one of the things that you have to do in your salat is this idea of tranquility and stillness, itmi'nan. And so you have to make sure that in every station of the prayer, you simply slow it down. That when you go into ruku' you stop for a moment. When you get up from bowing, that you stop for a moment. That when you go into sujood, that you're still for a moment. Let every joint completely rest. And when you've done this, you've completed a major aspect of perfecting the prayer, which is the idea of stillness, tranquility. And then number three, and this is a beautiful, beautiful tip when it comes to focus, and that is simply include variety. Variety. I give you an example. When you are going back from the masjid, or you're going back from work, or you're going back home from school, or wherever it is, it's a route that you're very, very familiar with. You're talking to somebody on the phone. And you're not paying attention to street signs, you're not paying attention to the road, because you've gone down this road a million times before. All of a sudden, the exit that you take is normally blocked. And you have to take a detour that you're unfamiliar with. What do you say to the person who you're on the phone with? What do you say to them? Say, I'm gonna call you back. Hold on a second, I can't talk right now. I gotta, I gotta figure this out. What you're saying to them is, I am taking an unfamiliar route, and so I need to actually be focused. Many times, we pray prayers that are on autopilot because we're praying the same salah that we learned to pray as children. The same athkar, the same dua, the same, the, everything is the same. You know, Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, rahimahullah, one time uh, I heard him say that when he, was, uh, when he was an Islamic school teacher, he taught kids, when he's teaching them salah, he taught them to make dua for him as their teacher in their sujood. He's teaching them to make that dua. Why? He said because most people don't change the salah they learned as children. It's like a, it's like a, a, a pro move right there. And he said he met a, a student 10 years later, and that student said to him, Sheikh, I've been making dua for you in every salah. And even though that's funny, it's at the same time sad, because every aspect of your life has changed from the time you've been seven to the time that you're 17, or from the time that you're seven to the time that you're 27, or 37, or 47, or 57. So how is it that your salah is still the same? And that's why there is so much variety in the prayer. Every station of the prayer, you will find many different adhkar, so many remembrances that are authentically reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa for you to be able to say one of the easiest, most beautiful books is the fortress of the Muslim. Just go through the fortress of the Muslim and see all of the different things that you can say when you enter into the prayer. All of the different things that you can say in ruku'ah. All of the different things that you can say getting up from ruku'ah. All of the things that you can say in sujood. All of the things that you can say in the jalsa between the two sajdas. There's so much variety and the salah is so deserving of our investment. It's so deserving of us spending some time learning more about the prayer so that we can take our salah out of autopilot. And one of the easiest things that we can do, even beyond learning new adhkar, is to simply dust off. We, have, we all have chapters of the Qur'an, surah of the Qur'an, that are not part of our daily rotation. We have our daily go-tos. These are the ones that we can do blindfolded, no problem. But then we have the ones that we know, but they're not, we're not so comfortable with. So those are the chapters that Pray in your prayer with these chapters. So that's number three, is to include variety in your prayer. And then number four, is to just practice the, the, the act of bringing yourself back. Anytime you get distracted in a conversation with anybody, catch yourself and practice bringing yourself back. Because at the source of that distraction, that type of distraction, is the idea of taking a conversation for granted. If I knew that the last conversation that I had with my mother might be my last conversation, how present would I be in that conversation? The last conversation that I have with my father is going to be the last conversation. My loved one, my friend, this is going to be the last time that we talk. But there is, what allows for that distraction is the feeling that Tomorrow, we'll catch up tomorrow. I don't need to pay attention. We'll have another time where I can hear that story. But if I practice simply anytime in any conversation with anybody that I just 
pay attention to my lack of focus. I got distracted here, let me bring myself back. I got distracted here, let me bring myself back. I got distracted here, let me bring myself back. It strengthens that ability to pay attention and that ability will f help you not only in your conversations with people, but it'll also help you in the salah. And then number five is the idea of identity. Who are you? You know, it's very easy when you go on campus at university, it's very easy for you to recognize the athletes because they're always walking around in, in gear. They're able to walk around in, 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 in uh, what's the word, uh, sweat pants, sweat hoodies, whatever those things are called. They're walking around in athletic gear all the time because they're an athlete. They're either co going to the gym or they're coming from the gym or on their, like, this is who they are. You're able to recognize them. What's interesting about the clothing of men throughout the Muslim world, anywhere, you look at Asham, you look at the Arabian Peninsula, you look at North Africa, you look at the Indian subcontinent, you look at Southeast Asia, and the men all wear clothes that facilitates the salah. It is either coming up to their knees, or it is coming up low on their hips, or it is a full thaw, or some variety of, but it is, it is clothes that facilitates the movement of the salah because the ummah is an ummah that prays. And so when a man or a woman go out into the world and they're dressed in clothes that is not appropriate for the salah, it makes me think that this person has not prioritized the salah in their life. If a guy is wearing aura uncovering shorts and they have to go and they have to go get something extra for them to be able to pray, I mean, it's very limiting. It's still very limiting. That person... Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing. Am I back? Not yet. I mean, it says that it's on and that there's battery. Testing, okay. Alhamdulillah. And so the idea of identity is incredibly important. Asking yourself, who am I? And in reality, the greatest aspect of our identity, the is that we're worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I am here every day of my life to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that, let that reflect in the way that I carry myself out in this world and let it reflect in the clothes that I wear because that is an incredible, it manifests, it reflects that identity that I have. I am a worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I wanted to, these are five quick tips inshallah, but I want to move to actually looking at the prayer. You know, there is a, a beautiful answer that was given by a scholar when he was asked how do you have khushu' in the prayer how do you have stillness in the prayer that humility in the prayer and he gave the example of that ceiling fan this ceiling fan here he said if it's going on high speed and you turn it off is it going to be still right away no it's going to take a long time to slow down I don't know if this is off or on right now but it, it's slowing down it's slowing down. And so when a person is living out in the world in high speed, and then they walk into the masjid, are they going to be able to turn off like that ceiling fan right away? No. It takes, it takes time for you to reach that stillness. And that's why you'll find so much preparation, so much presence that is required even before the salah. When the adhan is called, that adhan that is to the wudu that you make, to the walking to the salah, the Prophet Sallallahu says to walk with stillness and tranquility. The adhkar that you make when you hear the adhan, the adhkar that you make when you make wudu, that presence that you have when you're making wudu, all of that is preparation for you to come a couple of minutes before the salah, for you to sit and you are in salah while you're waiting for the salah. All of that is to facilitate or helps facilitate that presence, that stillness. And so I wanted to look at not just the salah itself, but some of the things that we do before the salah so that inshallah ta'ala we can become better at mindfulness in the salah. Number one, the first is when the adhan itself is called. And I want you to imagine, unfortunately, we don't live in a place where it rips through the neighborhood. But I want you to imagine the adhan as it is called. And the statement that is being made is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Now, Allahu Akbar means what? Give me a quick translation. Allah is the greatest. That's not what it means. Number two, give me another one. 
Allah is greater. And then number three, it's translated as Allah is great. Okay? Allah is great. So Allahu Akbar, Allah is great would be Allahu Kabirun. That's not it. Allahu is the greatest. That would be Allahu Akbar. Allahu Al Akbar. And that's not it. It is Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. And it is an incomplete sentence. Allah is greater. Why is it an incomplete sentence? Because it is to be filled by you. You are to fill in the blank. Allah is greater than whatever I'm doing right now. Allah is greater than me sitting at this coffee shop. Allah is greater than me catching up on this drama on Netflix. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than this book report. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than my work right now. Allah is greater than my family in this moment. Allah is greater than everything. Aisha radiallahu anha, she says the Prophet sallallahu would interact with us and he would, he would be involved with us and, and as present as present can be. But then when the adhan would be called, he would get up as if he didn't know us. Allah is greater than everything. And so that adhan is being called, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And you're filling in the blanks to whatever it is that you're saying. And then, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. Allah is greater than everything. Why? Because he's the one who's worthy of worship. And he's the one who's worthy of worship because he's an ilah. And for him to be the ilah, he is the one who has the perfect attributes. There is nothing that is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's perfect in his mercy and in his forgiveness and in his ability and in his power and in his wisdom and in his knowledge. He's perfect in every way. And so he's the only one who's worthy of worship. He's the one who's worthy of me getting up and stopping everything to go and worship. Shadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. And then I want you to think about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how this messenger who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and called to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been given such incredible success that all over the world people are proclaiming every minute of the day I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. Allah promises in the Quran, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We have raised your remembrance and here you are bearing witness to that remembrance being raised. And then that same Lord who gave the Prophet sallallahu that incredible success and ability is now telling you, you come to the prayer. Hayya ala salat. Come to the prayer. And come to success. Come to the prayer and come to success. Sometimes we shuffle our feet from coming to the prayer because we're seeking success somewhere. We're seeking success in our work. We're seeking success in school. We're seeking success somewhere. Happiness somewhere. And you're being told, come to success. The prayer is success. And beautifully, you say after the adhan what the mu'adhin says. But here, when you're being told, come to the prayer and come to success, you say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There is no source of transformation, hawl is transformation, and quwwa is ability without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are saying, I don't have the ability to transform from a state of heedlessness to a state of remembrance. I don't have power to come to the prayer without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For everybody who's here in the masjid right now and responded to the call, we are not here because we came here. We came because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the ability to come here. And so our presence here should not in inspire anything in us other than humility and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One brother once he told me, He's a, a, a convert, and I was asking him, like, when you're in the prayer, when you're in the salah, what are you thinking about? You don't understand Arabic. You don't understand what he's, what's being recited. He said, you know what I focus on? He said, I focus on in the fact that out of all of the people in Houston, Allah invited me to come to his house. And there might be only 10 or 15 people here for Salat al-Dhuhr in the masjid. And I, out of all of these people here, I was the one who was invited. And he said, when I think about that, he said, I am overwhelmed with tears throughout the salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings you. And so you say to the mu'addin, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. I don't have the ability to come if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give me to come. And then it repeats. But I want you to understand and I want you to notice that the slogan of the adhan is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And we're going to see that in the slogan of salah, like the slogan of hajj is labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, here I am, O Allah. The slogan of the salah is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. We see it throughout the salah. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that 
whoever says after the mu'adhin has made their adhan. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Raditu billahi rabba wa bi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nabiyya wa bil Islam dina that whoever says, I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is messenger, I am pleased with Allah as my Lord. I am pleased with Muhammad as my messenger. I am pleased with Islam as my religion. All of their previous sins are forgiven. And we're going to see that throughout the prayer, there are so many opportunities for a person's sins to be forgiven. And this is the first of them. That you just simply say after the mu'addin, I bear witness that there is nothing worthy, and I'm pleased with Allah. And I want you to think about that. What does that mean? I'm pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as my Lord. I'm pleased with Islam as my deen. I'm pleased with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A person reaches a place in their life where they feel so privileged that while everybody else is worshipping what they're worshipping, everybody else is worshipping what they're worshipping, I am worshipping Allah. There are people who are worshipping money. There are people who are worshipping other gods with other characteristics and attributes. And I am worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is so forgiving that there is no intercessor between me and him. Anytime I ask for forgiveness, he forgives me. Anytime I repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he accepts my repentance. He extends his hand during the day to accept the forgiveness of those who, who sin at night. And he extends his hand during the night to accept the repentance of those who sin during the day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hamid, al-razzaq, al-kabir. I'm worshipping a Lord of perfect attributes. I don't know who everybody else is worshipping. I feel so privileged. And when everybody else is following whatever paths that they're following, I'm following Islam. It's steady. I'm anchored. I am not enslaved, I am not beholden to people's values that are shifting every day. I am, I am following something that is constant and something that is true. And when everyone else is following whoever it is that they're following, or whoever it is that they're following, I'm following Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when a person feels that privilege, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, ذَاقَ طَعْمَ الْحَلَاوَةَ الْإِيمَانِ ذَاقَ حَلَاوَةَ الْإِيمَانِ مَنْ رَضِيَ بِاللَّهِ رَبَّا that person has tasted the sweetness of faith, the one who is pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as their Lord and, Muhammad, and Islam as their religion and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as their messenger. It becomes sweet to you. And then we fast forward to wudu. And when you make wudu, you know there was a, a sister who accepted Islam in the masjid a couple of weeks ago. And she accepted Islam a little bit before Maghrib. And so I told one of the sisters, I told her, go and, 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 and uh, walk her through wudu. Walk her through wudu. And she did. And when they came back out later, the sister told me, she said, that was like the best wudu I've ever made in my life. She was like, I was so present when I was teaching her how to make wudu. I saw Muslim early, Mu'min earlier showing uh, Antonio how to make wudu early as well. It's beautiful, right? Mu'min probably was the best wudu of his life today. Because you're, you're present. A lot of times our wudu becomes so robotic and we don't pay attention to the, the idea. I want, you to pay, I want you to make wudu like it is your first time. Or I want you to make wudu like you're showing someone else who's making wudu for their first time. This wudu is a source of incredible barakah. It is a source of incredible reward. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that there is no Muslim or Mu'min who makes wudu except that sins are falling from your hands. When you're washing your hands, everything that you've done with your hands falls off with the water or with the last drop of water. When you wash your face, everything that you looked at. When you wash your arms, when you wash your feet, everywhere you've walked in sin becomes washed off. Visualize that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Shall I not tell you something that through it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises ranks and he forgives sins? Isbaq al wudu ala al makarih. That a person perfects their wudu even when it's difficult. When is wudu difficult? Everyone says the cold. But it's not going to be difficult for a while then. It's also difficult when some people are in public, it's awkward. Still perfecting your wudu. It's also difficult depending on the clothes that you're wearing. Some of our brothers, if you're wearing a three-piece suit, wudu becomes very difficult. You got to take off layers after layers. Sisters too, sometimes you're wearing those ibayas that are difficult to, to peel back. Sometimes we have mobility issues. The sink is way too high. 
There are all sorts of scenarios where wudu becomes challenging. And you want to take shortcuts. And Rasulullah sallallahu says, perfecting your wudu even when it's difficult. When you perfect your wudu even when it's difficult, status gets raised, sins get forgiven. And Rasulullah sallallahu says that when you're done with wudu, and whoever says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, wa abduhu wa rasuluh, Allahumma aj'alni min al-tawwabin, wa aj'alni min al-mutatahirin. I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and his messenger. O oh Allah, make me of those who repent to you and make me of those who purify themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who repent and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those who purify themselves. You have just purified your outer through the wudu and now you've asked Allah to purify your inner through repentance. And when the inner and the outer have been purified, now you are ready to stand in front of the king. And so now you approach the salah. And you are to face the qibla. And if any one of us decided in the salah to turn around 180 degrees, what would happen to our prayer? Our prayer would be nullified. And so the scholars say, if you are so particular, brothers pull out their compasses, which way is the qibla? And they sit there and they... But if a person is so particular about facing the qibla with their body, they say, don't forget to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your heart. You can't be so focused that your body is in this particular direction and meanwhile your heart is touring the world and coming back. And then when you say Allahu Akbar, you say Allah is greater. And the symbolism that some of the scholars mention is that you're casting the dunya behind you. It's like you're going like this. Everything is behind me now. Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. And you're saying Allah is greater. Allah is greater than what? Again, Allah is greater than everything. And so they said, beware that the first statement that you make in your salah be a lie. Don't let the first thing you say in salah be a lie. When you say Allahu Akbar, pay attention to what you're saying. You are saying Allah is greater. And now, as soon as you say that, get ready. Shaytan is going to start hitting you with everything he's got, including the kitchen sink. So, what then? I'm entering into a battle now. As soon as you enter into the salah, I'm now in a battle with shaytan. And so there are so many things throughout the prayer where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated for you to protect yourself from shaytan or to fight back against shaytan. And we'll talk about a few of them inshallah ta'ala if we have time. But the first thing that I want you to know is that there are so many adhkar that you make entering into the prayer. It's called dua al-istiftah. The dua of entering into the prayer. And I don't have time to go through a number of them. What I'll tell you to do is go through the fortress of the Muslim and you'll find a number of them there. But I want to just look at one of them. And it is a beautiful one. I can't tell you how many times I've met Muslims who are ashamed to pray because of what they know of their own sins. I'm too ashamed. I've done this. I've done that. I've done this. I've done that. And so it is so beautiful and perfect and appropriate that one of the du'as we are taught to make when you enter into the salah is, Oh Allah, distance me from my sins like I've, you've distanced between the east and the west. Allahumma ba'id bayni wa bain khatayai kama ba'adta bain al mashriq wal mahr. Oh Allah, distance me from my sins, like you've distanced between the East and the West. min And wash me of my sins, like a white garment is washed of filth. min And cleanse me of my sins, like with water and ice and hail. That person who is ashamed of their sins, you are being taught, when you walk into the salah, let the first thing that you ask yourself, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, cleanse me of my sins. Wash me of those sins. Distance me from those sins like you've distanced the east and the west. And then beautifully, do you wash, when you're washing a white garment, do you wash it with hot water or cold water? What do you guys say? Hot or cold? Cold water, right? These are all the people who don't know how to wash. You wash with what? A white garment? You wash it with hot. So then the question becomes, why, did, why is the hadith to wash it with cold? 
I mean, I see what y'all did. You guys said, oh, the hadith says cold, so it must be cold. But it's actually, it is interesting. Why are you being asked, or why are you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to wash with cold, with ice, with hail? The ulama said, because sins burn. They burn. They cause people to be ashamed. They cause people to be embarrassed. They cause people to be, they, they carry that heat in their heart. And so you're asking Allah Azza wa Jal to cool your breast, cool your chest, cool your heart. That's number one. Number two, when you have something that's sticky, what do you wash it with? That you wash with ice. You ever got gum on your garment? Use ice, use some sort of... And they said that sins, they stick to you. And so you're asking Allah Azza wa Jal to remove it with ice and with hail. So you've entered into the salah, and then the surah vary, the chapters of the Quran vary, but what does stay consistent every rak'ah is Surah Al-Fatiha. And Surah Al-Fatiha is a miracle. The entire Quran is a miracle, but Surah Al-Fatiha is a miracle. And it is a miracle that is apparent. You know, when I was a kid, I used to ask, why there's a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu says, every prophet was given a miracle through which the people believed in him. And I was given revelation. And so I wish to have the largest number of followers on the Day of Judgment. And I remember being a kid thinking to myself like, the Prophet Sallallahu didn't get the splitting of, the, of, the, of the, the, the sea like Musa or raising the dead like Isa. The Prophet Sallallahu or, or the, the kingdom of Sulaiman the Prophet ﷺ was simply given revelation. He wasn't given like, like these types of fantastic miracles. He was given revelation. And yet Rasulullah ﷺ says, I wish to have the largest number of followers on the Day of Judgment. What's the relationship between the first part of the hadith and the second part? I was given revelation, so I want to have the largest number of followers on the Day of Judgment. It's beautiful. As amazing as the splitting of the sea was, if you weren't with that group of Bani Israel who witnessed it with their eyes, for everybody else it's what? It's not something that they've witnessed. If you weren't there with Jesus when he raised the dead, for everybody else it's something that they hear about but they did not witness. But the Prophet says, what well, I was given is revelation. And so I hope to have the largest number of followers on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ is the Prophet who is given a miracle that is witnessed by every generation of his community. Everyone can witness the miracle of Rasulullah ﷺ and Al-Fatiha is a miracle. And I'll give you an easy, easy example. And you might have never noticed this before because I never noticed it until someone told me. And then I was like, that is amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed Surah Al-Fatiha in a way that you never ever get tired of hearing it. If it was any other chapter of the Qur'an, if every time the Imam led with Qul Hu Allahu Hat, eventually there would be a fight in the masjid. If at one point in time, a person decided to read every time with any other surah of the Qur'an, people would get bored, people would get distracted, people would get bothered by it. And yet Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala made it as, as seamless for us as breathing. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala made it as beautiful for us as, 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 as a part of us, as our own selves. And so you never get tired of Surah Al-Fatiha, no matter how much you've read it, no matter how much times you've heard it, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala made this Surah that special and that unique. And I want to just point to a couple of things in Surah Al-Fatiha. I want you to notice the iltifat in Surah Al-Fatiha. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. The iltifat means the shifting of tense. You are standing in front of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith that's reported by a Muslim, Qasamtu salata bayni wa bayna abdi. I have divided the entire salah between me and my servant. And so when a servant, when you say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, Allah says, my servant has praised me. And when you say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Athna alayya abdi, my servant has praised me. And when you say, or he says, my servant has celebrated me. 
And then when you say, Malik Yawm din the master of the Day of Judgment, Allah says, my servant has glorified me. And then when you say, you alone do we worship, you alone we seek for help, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is between me and my servant, and my servants will have what they are asking for. And then you recite the rest of the surah, and Allah says, this is between me and my servant, and my servant will have what they are asking for. When you are reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, visualize that conversation. Every time you recite a verse from that surah, Allah responds to you. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz used to have that pause between the verses. And when he was asked why, he said, I'm visualizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's response to me. And this surah, that is a request. You are asking Allah for guidance. There is a change in tense in the surah. The first part of the surah, when you say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, is that in the second person or the third person or the first person? All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Which person is that? That's third person. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Is that first person, second person, or third person? That's third person. You're speaking to someone as if they're absent. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Malik Yawm din the master of the Day of Judgment. Is that first person, second person, or third person? Third person, still. You alone do we worship, you alone we seek for help. What tense is that? Second person. The rest of the surah continues in the second person. Why that change? Why that shift? Scholars mention a number of reasons, and they say number one is praise more sincere in a person's absence or in a person's presence? It's more sincere in a person's absence. And so even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never absent, when you're praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's more beautiful that it be done in the third person. And a request is more expected to be responded to in the second person. And so the second half of the surah, because it is a request, it shifts to the second person. But another one that's beautiful is they say it is as if at the beginning of the surah, you are standing on the outside of the court of the king. And you're entreating entrance, and so you begin by saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm din You're praising Allah. And as you are praising Allah, the doors open and you are ushered in, and then you are in His presence. And it is as if you're looking at Him. And so you speak to Him directly, Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. You alone do we worship, you alone we seek for help. And it continues on. Surah Al-Fatiha, and then you go into Ruku'ah. And when you go into ruku', you say Subhan Rabbil Azim, but you say Allahu Akbar again. You say Allah is greater. And in all of the motions of the prayer, except getting up from ruku', you continue in motion to say Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater. Allah is greater. Allah is greater. It's like you're a camera that's adjusting again and again and again. I get distracted. I say Allah is greater. I get distracted. I say Allah is greater. I get distracted again. I say Allah is greater. Every motion. And here's a a, a super tip. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiyallahu anhu not Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman rather Ammar ibn Yasir Ammar ibn Yasir radiyallahu anhu was praying a prayer and one of the tabi'in he said to him you know you, you pray a really short prayer he said your prayer is really short he said that to Ammar ibn Yasir so Ammar ibn Yasir this great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says to him did you notice me missing any of its pillars. He said, no, you did everything that you're supposed to do, but it was just short. So Ammar ibn Yasir then said to him, I wanted to beat the distraction of shaitan. If me standing for a long time is going to cause for me to be distracted, let me bow. If me bowing for a long time is going to make me distracted, let me get up. If me going into sujood, let me keep moving in the salah. Let me keep it moving. One station to the next, I again get to refocus. Sheikh Kamal mentioned to me a beautiful story once. And he said that there was a, a Muslim family that had somewhere in, in the Muslim world, and they had a, a, a maid in their house who was non-Muslim. She was Christian. And so one Ramadan, they decided to, uh, or they were praying taraweeh in their house, and she decided that she wanted to join them. She wanted to pray with them. But she wanted to pray sitting down, her way. And so they're praying taraweeh. 
and she's sitting in her spot. It wasn't long before she couldn't help but fall asleep. Just her prayer, the fact that it was so static, there's no motion in it, it was hard for her. Could you imagine if we had to come and pray two hours of taraweeh in one position? And so you see the beauty of the motion in the salah even. The fact that it helps us in our focus, that we are going from one stage to the next, one stage to the next, one stage to the next. You go into ruku' and here you are bowing, you are teaching yourself humility and you're saying, Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. exalted is my Lord from imperfection, the great. Some of us were able to absolve, were able to, 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 to remove every deity from our hearts, except our own ego. And so you are training yourself and you're saying, my Lord is the one who is Al-Azim. And then you stand back up and you say, Rabbana lak alhamd. Oh Allah, to you belongs all praise. And there's so much that you can say in this station. But you're thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's beautiful that you thank Allah when you come back into this position of being erect again. This is a station while you're standing upright. This is a station that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored us with, human beings. And it is an honor that is stripped from the disbelievers on the Day of Judgment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that the disbeliever will be forced to walk on their face into the hellfire. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, we're going to walk on our face? And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Subhanallah is not the one who made them walk on their feet in the dunya, able to make them walk on their feet or walk on their face on the Day of Judgment? Tadal. Did everybody repeat after the Mu'adhin? Sometimes we have the problem, alhamdulillah, sometimes we have the problem of being knowledge junkies where we learn things but then we don't practice them. These things are very simple. They're very simple, but who's the one who does them? And so sometimes people ask the question and they say, I, I didn't learn anything new in a lecture or in a khutbah or anything like that. But the, the, uh, the objective is not always to learn something new. Many of us know a lot and if we simply implemented what we knew, we'd be in great shape. But it is about implementing. And so these things are, are small, they're easy to do, but the one who's able to do them is the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given success to. So, the quick, uh, to, to summarize inshallah ta'ala, to, to, to speak quickly about sujood inshallah, and then the jalsa, and then we'll, we'll end inshallah. But, a person then goes into sujood. And sujood is the great symbol of the salah. The masajid are called masajid, the masjid, the place of sujood. And there are so many things to pay attention to when a person is in sajda. There are so many different motivations a person can have. There are so many different ways that a person can engage with the sajda. Of them, is to engage with the sajda, appreciating the closeness and the proximity that you enjoy in that moment. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that a person is closest to Allah when they are in sujood. Fajtahidu fi dua, he says. So make a lot of dua. Make a lot of dua when you're in sujood. What duas do you make in your sajda? That's the question. What duas do you make in your sajda? Who do you make dua for? You know, there was a brother who I met one time and he, he told me, he said, you know, he was 20-something years old, already married, already had a great job, already had a kid. So he said to me, he said, you know what, to be honest, I don't really have a lot of things to make dua for. Kind of ran out of milestones. And so I said to him, did you enter Jannah yet? And he said, no. He said, but I, but I guess I do have a lot of things to make dua for. But even beyond entering Jannah, and absolutely, you should make dua for that. Don't you have a, a family member who's sick? Don't you have a, a friend who's unemployed? Don't you have problems going all over the Muslim world? Don't you have people who are in need? Like, how can a person be so disconnected from the people around them? Abu Darda, he said, I make dua for 70 of my brothers in my salah, in my witir. I name them and their father's names. Full picture, like their full name. First name, last name. I make dua for 70 of them. And so when you're going into every sajda, 
Every sajda is incredibly valuable real estate. You are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I would encourage that you have some sort of program for your sujood. That the first sajda is always for your parents. It's always for your parents. Now the other seven, if it's a four rak'ah prayer, you've got another seven sajdas. Divide and, and conquer. Divide and conquer. I've got my I've got my exams, I have my health, I have this person's health, I have whatever it is. Making dua for my akhirah as well. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَنْسَلَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your portion of this world. But we also have to remind each other, don't forget your portion of the hereafter. Because many times people, when they make dua, they simply want to make dua for the dunya. But you make dua for the hereafter as well. That's one motivation when you're in sujood. The closeness. And then a popular question is, can I make dua in my native tongue while I'm in sujood? The answer to that, I believe, is yes. Even if it's an obligatory prayer, even if it's an obligatory prayer for the person who is not fluent in Arabic, that is the fatwa of the American Muslim Jurist Association, Amja. And so if a person is not fluent in Arabic, they can speak in whatever language they are most fluent in. The one where you are able to complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the most sincerity and the most presence. But if a person is fluent in Arabic, then this isn't the time for them to be practicing their Spanish or their French or anything like that. Another motivation while you're in sujood, Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسْجُدْ وَقْتَرِبْ Allah says, prostrate and come near. So appreciating the closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and also recognizing that in this moment you are also causing a lot of harm to shaitan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that when the son of Adam prostrates, shaitan cries. Big cry baby. He says, the son of Adam was commanded to prostrate, and he prostrated, so for him is paradise. And I was commanded to prostrate, and I did not, so for me is the hellfire. And so there are lots of motivations, and there are even more than that. But then you get up in between the two sajdas, and you're in this moment of jalsa. You're in this moment of sitting. And I want to ask you, who do you sit in the presence of? Who do you sit in the presence of? You sit in the presence of a king? No, you stand in the presence of a king. It's very important, it's very appropriate that you stand with one hand over the left in a position that Imam Ahmed says is, is dhul wa inkisar al aziz al jabbar It is humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very appropriate that you stand in front of Allah like this. It's very appropriate that you bow to Allah. It's very appropriate that you prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But who do you sit in front of? You sit in front of a friend. And so it is amazing that you sit in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like you're being told, sit down, have a seat. But what's beautiful about the salah also is that it allows, these positions allow for multiple emotions. And so for some people who are wanting that comfort in that moment, I want you to be amazed that you get to sit in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then, the scholars also said that it is the sitting of a person who is about to be executed. When you're on your knees like that and the blade is on your neck, and what are you saying? Rabbi khfirli, Rabbi khfirli, Rabbi khfirli. My Lord, forgive me. My Lord, forgive me. My Lord, forgive me. So it allows for these different emotions. And then you go into sujood again. And I want you to appreciate that of all of the things that we've done in the salah, there's only one thing that you've been prescribed two doses of, and that's sajda. More closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. More opportunity for dua. More opportunity for humility. And then you repeat and repeat and repeat until you get to the tashahud. And I want to conclude with this, with the tashahud. We don't have the time to break down most of the meanings. But you say, At-tahiyyatu lillah, as-salawatu tayyibat You say all tahiyyat, scholars mention the number of things. Of it is that they mention greetings. Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, he mentions this in his commentary on Umdud al-Ahkam. He says, that it has been said that it means greetings, you're greeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's been said that life emanates from Allah. Even when you meet a king, you say long live the king, but what do you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You say all life emanates from al-hay. It emanates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was salawatu tayyibat. And salawat is blessings. 
Ulaika alayhim salawatum min rabbihim wa rahma. So salawat is different from rahma. Salawat is blessings, they emanate from Allah. Wa tayyibat and all goodly things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a tayyib himself. He's the pure and the holy and the goodly. And he only accepts that which is pure. Assalamu alayka yuhan nabi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How unbelievable is this? Your entire prayer completely from the beginning was all directed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not directed to anybody else. You didn't speak to anybody else in the salah. And for the first moment in the salah, you are now speaking directly to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alayka yuhan nabi. Oh, peace be upon you, O oh messenger. It's as if while you're sitting in that tashahud, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has entered into the room and is standing in front of you and you are looking at the Prophet sallallahu and you are sending salam directly to him. The scholars hypothesize why that is the case and of the beautiful things that they've suggested is that you are giving salam to the one who taught you this prayer. Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. And so it is only appropriate that you ask Allah Azza wa Jal to send his peace and blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And then you make the dua and you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala Ali Ibrahim. And this is beautiful too because you are asking Allah to send salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the followers of Muhammad like he sent salam upon Ibrahim and the followers of Ibrahim. But I have a question for you that you all know the answer to. Isn't Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam higher in station than Ibrahim alayhi salam? The answer is yes. And so the question then becomes, why are you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send peace and blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like Ibrahim when we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in a station higher? And the ulama answered a number of ways. Number one, they said, kama here, like, doesn't mean equivalency in, in the amount, but equivalency in the action itself. So like you sent salam upon Ibrahim, sent salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his followers. But another beautiful answer that was suggested by the scholars is that it is not so much about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and Ibrahim, but it is about Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala Ibrahim. Who is the Al of Muhammad? Who's the followers of Muhammad and who's the followers of Ibrahim? If you look on Ibrahim's side, it's all of the prophets of Bani Israel. It's an all-star cast. It's Musa and Harun and Sulaiman and Dawood and Isa and Zakariya and everybody. And who's on the side of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Click. Muslims from Katy. Like it's, it's the Ummah. There are no prophets. Sahaba, yes. Great people, yes. But nobody of the level of. And so on one side you have Ibrahim and however many prophets and, and, and worshippers and all of that on that side. And on this side, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send an equivalent amount of barakah, blessings, salam upon Muhammad and his followers, like he sent upon Ibrahim alayhi salam and his followers. And then you send, uh, and then uh, you have another moment to make dua before the taslim. You have another moment to make dua before the taslim. And that is beautiful also. It's like when you've come to someone's office and you're getting up to leave and they tell you anything else I can do you sure you don't want anything nothing for the road before you leave the salam the salah you have that last option of making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you say assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah to your right and envision this dua that you are making for the entire hemisphere to your right all of the righteous servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you exit the salah, making salam in both directions, asking Allah for his peace and blessings and barakah upon all of his righteous servants. And then you guard your prayer. And you guard your prayer, I'll end with this, you guard your prayer by not being impressed by your prayer, not being satisfied with your prayer. No matter what you've done of worship, no matter how amazing your salah was, you know that it was not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deserves. And so you hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from you. And then you show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing you to experience that prayer. So you make the adhkar after the salah. Allahumma inni ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husna ibadatik. A beautiful dhikr that we were taught to make. Oh Allah, assist me in remembering you and showing gratitude to you and worshipping you beautifully. 
the Prophet Sallallahu told Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he said, don't forget to say that after every salah because if Allah facilitates for you remembering him, then you're going to thank him. And if you thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what will he do? لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ I will increase you. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases you, then he will facilitate beautiful worship of him because he will only increase you in better salat. He will only increase you in more sweetness. We ask Allah Azza wa to make us of al khashi'in We ask Allah Azza wa that he accepts from us our prayers, that he makes us of those who love the salat, that he makes us of those whose hearts are attached to the masjid, and that he makes us of those whose salawat are accepted by him. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. 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 Wa s